Hello there. Meeting you after some unavoidable gaps. Well, glad to be back. You are tuning in to the 94th episode of the Audible Weed Walk. This is Nina welcoming you. Well, even though the topic of the day is slightly different, how can I not start today wishing all of you Shubha Vijaya and Happy Dashera? Today is also a very special day. It is the birth celebration of Prophet Muhammad. Today and tomorrow. So, Happy Eid Milad Ul Nabi, wishing you joy and prosperity for all. Actually, my last pod- podcast was on Jitia festival- festivities in the Jharkhand area. Realize that in West Bengal, on the same day, um, Manasha is worshipped, which is a local goddess of snakes. It is also the same day Vishwakarma is worshipped. Vishwakarma, sort of the celestial engineer. Interestingly, a similar worship of equipment and all arts and crafts happens in South India on the Navaratri day in the, in the form of worship of Saraswati. Um, it, I always wondered about, you know, about that. How is that that in the Eastern India we worship Saraswati around February and it also marks the season's occasional misty rain, which is called... Um, uh, this is when the Hilsa fish turns back and returns to the estuary after spawning in the fresh river water of Ganga. The rain is called Hilsa Guri and the Saraswati Puja day uh, in the East Bengal tradition um, is when Hilsa, um, you know, it marks the beginning of um, eating season of Hilsa, which technically should end with the rains. I wonder if there is uh, some Hilsa culture in Tamil Nadu, where it is known as Pulasa. Well, about Saraswati Puja in Tamil Nadu, I recently realized when I read the true form of Shakti in its various forms, including Durga, Kali, one of its form is also Maha Saraswati. Interesting to... Um, uh, to in interesting to note, time and again, one realized that all these various forms are one and it leads to that one formless universe. That is true if you are describing Mahakala, which is Shiva, or Mahakali, the Shakti. Uh, learning dance, uh, we used to dance to a shloka, Angikam Bhuvanam Yasya Vajikam Sarva Vyangyam Vangmayam Aharyam Chandra Taradi Tvam Namaha Swadvikam Shivam. It describes Shiva. We bow to him, the benevolent one, whose limbs are the universe, whose songs and poetry are the essence of all languages, whose ornaments are the moons and the stars. I always find these interconnections and leading to the universe quite amazing. Now let us start with our topic, primary topic of the day, the peek into the human relation with food and nature. Recently I read an article by Sarah Lasko on America's last crops. Interesting article that questions the notion that agriculture started in the world in one or two places like the Nile Basin um, or the Oaxaca region of today's Mexico or Mexico. The author uh, reported many simultaneous findings that lead to the notion that not one but simultaneously various centers of agriculture came up as a natural process of evolution of humans across the globe globe, rather than one center of origin and then spread. You know, if you have been listening to my podcasts or um, presentations, you may have heard me wondering how some plants, say the Solanum nigrum complex, Complex refers to the several species that are closely related to Solanum nigrum, which in South India it is called Manatakali. How they are pre-processed in very similar manner across the globe. How each human groups in different continents came up with the exact same way of boiling or blanching the leaves in hot water and throwing all or most of the water before cooking. So this new finding 
is in some way also supplements this simultaneous evolution. Archaeologists have now identified a dozen or more places where cultivation began independently, including Central America, Western and Eastern Africa, South India and New Guinea. Within each of these areas, say the Fertile Crescent in Africa, the people domesticated different varieties of wheat removed by space and time within that area. Isn't that interesting? Until very recently, it was believed that the knowledge of agriculture moved from Central America to North America, which is the present-day USA and Canada. But now, paleobotanists and paleoethnobiologists think that there are several wild plants that people kind of cultivated and ate and what today um, is known as weeds. They are not weed, some weed, little barley, may grass and peat seed goose food. Uh, these are primarily prairie species. The last one is closely related to the quinoa but not cultivated any longer. In fact, all these plants not only are considered weeds, just like the wild weedy plants in our backyard, they also face the stigma for being too tiny or too wild. Yet, the recent evidence, however, tells a very different story. It is true that from the wild corn uh, came teosinte, uh, which looks like, I bet, um, and tests quite different from the um, sweet corn we have come to love and um, or any wild relatives of our modern crops or food were not very tasty and sometimes even uh, had high doses of toxin that needs to be removed. That, you know, that, yeah, that still uh, it's like that. So why did we choose to eat them? I mean... Put yourself in one of these early, you know, you know, feet of these early humans. What would make you invest time and effort on any of these um, plants, not knowing one day a variety might emerge that are tasty and nutritious? At the same time, probably they were nutritious to begin with. Actually, a while back, I have shared uh, with some of those thoughts. Makes me quite elated now reading some of them reflected in the research findings. If you want to catch my podcast episode number 52, What Sets the Wild Plants Apart? This is when you can uh, um, um, have, a, have a listen to that. And if you really consider that out of 300,000 plant species, humans have known the use of only 10% of them know the use and end up using even f fewer. The world trade in food happens with a handful of known varieties. Why this is so? What makes those 10% plants more desirable or attractive to humans? Consider um, any of these wild plants. One wonders what was about them that made the ancient people in different continents with different backgrounds and environments decide to invest time and energy on them. Turn out that all wild plant crops, uh, wild crops um, that ultimately were used um, by the humans um, or were grown, collected, cultivated, share some common characters. Some of them, uh, where they grew well, their seeds grew larger with slight nurturing. And the seed coat leading to the nutritious kernel grew thinner as they morphed into a more desirable crop. Now, that is interesting. So, when we nurture even a non-grain wild plant, say a wild green, we often notice that not only uh, they are easier to pick because we know exactly where they are, but they also move into in becoming a more desirable plant. Like their desirable parts, um, which we want to use, are uh, more abundant. Take, uh, for example, wild punnangani, alternanthera tenella, or avara lanata, mountain knotgrass. Similar name to uh, the one in the North America, right? Well, these two, for example, grow profusely 
in if you if you look around your backyard i bet you will find them um in here in you know in this part of tamil nadu but they occur in patches and then they quickly come into flower making the leaves that are actually eaten very small so it is not very easy to pick i would say despite their prolific presence it's not much used but the same plant at the edge of the garden where it is getting some regular spray of water or protection from the herbivores both of them show lush leafy growth not only that they are they grow large tall greener and the leaves become much larger making them easier to pick and eat so no so um no need to think that the ancient people were any different they too liked easy picks and went for the plants that shows those traits but the question remains why these particular plants how come they were noticed another theory proposes that omnivore hunter gatherer humans had to follow and know about the whereabouts of not only different kinds of plants and fruits but also animals that they hunted especially the prey species in north america um that was likely american bison in their prairie habitat in the tropics and in the humid forest the niche for the different prey and their seasonality and habitat presence were no, known to early tribal humans turned out that the plants that ended up in the archaeological evidence has been used as food are the ones that grew well in the area treaded by the wild animals in in the article they talk about american bison because they are talking about prairies and in north america so where the american bison roamed certain species could use that phenomena that disturbance removal of competition or maybe some other factors and grew in patches in those areas they would be easier to notice easier to pick and if they were left to grow they would grow tall and their seeds grew larger making them very desirable this seemingly simplistic logic will have so many layers of complex knowledge and decision making for ancient people in the tropics at some point like the megras goose foot knotweed little bali and sampid they fell out of favor and the corn on the cob that was also found by the paleobotanists as food remnants um though much smaller than the corn we know today somehow survived and were favored but world over there is an understanding now that our focus on only a few plants for our food is unhealthy for us humans and for the planet diversity is the key to life so does um, so you know does it mean that we can uh, soon find goose food along with the quinoa in the north american market and then the world over and our millets and the local varieties will be encouraged to grow instead of the gmo gmo fortified processed food grains well hopefully that will be the trend um that will be a win 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 situation logical resource efficient and healthy what more can we want with that thought let me end this week i have i'm leaving you with a lot of um uh, thought to ponder upon um i will see you next week uh next week is the world food day so let's see what we talk about Stay well and stay safe. This is Oroville Radio. Voices from the City of Dome.